Baruchem Abayim. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. The uh, lecture tonight will be a two-part lecture on uh, Moshe's mission, um, following Moshe from his birth uh, until his uh, giving of the Torah, bringing it down from Mount Sinai. Maybe a little further, we'll see. But the uh, with the holiday of Shavuos around the corner, I thought that it would be ap- appropriate an appropriate time to study the main character of the story of Shuot, Moshe. So let us begin with his birth. The Torah does not tell us who his parents were, even though both of his both his father, who was Amram, and his mother Yochebet were illustrious individuals, especially with his father serving as the leader of the generation. The Torah in the second chapter of the book of Exodus begins with the words, And a man of the house of Levi went and married Levi's daughter. Neither of his parents are mentioned by name. But why? This teaches us a great lesson. Children are born with their own missions and personalities. We don't bring them up. We don't give it to them. God does. As I mentioned before, more than we bring up our children, we bring up ourselves. We as parents hopefully help them on their way. Is a child who is brought up in dire poverty, handicapped, or are they blessed with an overpowering desire to succeed? After all, they only have one direction to move in, up. Is a child brought up with a silver spoon in their mouth crippled because they have not really been challenged by life? Or are they fortunate to be given all the advantages that money can buy? The Torah's vague description of Moshe's parents tells us that he was born with a specific mission, which means that he could have been born to any parents, and he still would have grown up to be Moshe. This can be seen by the fact that for most of his early formative years, he was actually brought up as a prince in the house of Paro. Not necessarily the preferred environment that one would choose for the greatest prophet that would ever live. Everything that occurred in Moshe's life fit perfectly, like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Every piece placed in the right place at the right time. Pharaoh's daughters bringing him into the palace and bringing him up as a son. <laughs> Poetic justice. Pyro himself was grooming the savior of the Jewish nation in his own house. So Moshe being brought up in Pyro's palace was not an accident. It was really, it was a necessity. Eighty years later, he would stand in front of Pyro, the most powerful ruler in the world. And he would have to stand before him with confidence and dignity. Think of standing in the Oval Office in the White House. Now, I don't care whether you like the president or not. The history of the office and the room itself would be overwhelming. In a negotiation, you would start off at a great disadvantage. However, when Moshe stood in front of Paro, the magnificent throne room that he was standing in was actually the same room that he played games in with other children when he was a child. No awe whatsoever. He felt right at home since he was. There's a measure that says that one day young Moshe takes the crown off of Paro's head and places it on his own. Paro's advisor suggested to him that he should kill the young Jewish child as they saw this as a sign that one day that he would take his kingdom. Other advisors said, no, it was just a sparkle of the jewels in the crown that had caught his eye. So they proposed a test. They set up two bowls. One of the bowls was filled with precious jewels and the other with hot burning coals. They said that if he reaches for the jewels, it would be a sign that he would take the kingdom in the future. And if so, then he should be put to death now. But if he reached for the hot coals, well, then it would show that he was just a young child, attracted to anything that sparkled. The measure continues and says that Moshe was reaching for the jewels, but an angel pushed his hand into the hot coals. Moshe placed a hot coal in his mouth, which gave him a permanent speech impediment. This too became important in the development of Moshe's personality and also in his ability to fulfill his mission. Since he had a speech impediment, it would have forced him to become a great listener. People who listen more than they talk learn a great deal more. There's a reason why God created us with two ears and only one mouth. It also follows that you have it would be more liked by others, since you would be a better listener and at the same time less likely to be a tail-bearer, lush and hard. 
In addition, when Moshe spoke to the people, he did not convince them of his mission by his gift of gab. With his speech defect, he could have been he would have been the last person that you would have chosen to speak to the Jewish nation, to Paro and the Egyptian people to bring about the redemption from Egypt. Think of it. The man who said of himself, Bani Aral Safatayim, that I have a speech defect, winds up being the greatest orator in Jewish history. No one, no one speaks more than Moshe. For 40 years, he speaks to the people and teaches them the laws of the Torah. Being a prince allowed Moshe to learn about military strategy, martial arts, weaponry, all disciplines connected with warfare. He also was involved in the running of the government. When we say in the Shabbat morning Amida, we say the words Yismach Moshe b'matnas chelko, that Moshe was happy with his portion. The commentary explained this was said in reference to Moshe's advice to Paro to allow the Jewish slaves to take one day off so that they would be more productive the rest of the week. The day Moshe chose was the Shabbat, and when he saw it, it was God's special day, ah, well, he was very overjoyed. Moshe started to take an interest in the plight of this people. He went out to the field and there he saw an Egyptian overseer who was beating a Jew. Moshe killed the Egyptian and buried his body in the sand. It seems that the very next day he came upon the same two men and they were fighting with each other. When he rebuked them, one of them sarcastically remarked to him, Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Well, Moshe was frightened. He said, now the incident is known. And the next verse tells us that Paro tries to kill Moshe, but he escapes. This too was no accident. Moshe was taking much too much of an interest in the plight of his brethren. The nation was not yet ready to be redeemed. In addition, in order for Moshe to be an effective leader, he needed to be someone that the people were not familiar with. He needed to be a stranger. And Aaron is forced to make a golden calf, and Moshe does not. So when Moshe says his words, it can also be understood in another way. Moshe also always wondered what was the sin that caused the Jewish nation to be enslaved. And when he saw that the same two men that he had saved from the Egyptian overseer turned him into Paro, he said, now I know what the sin is. They are a nation that speaks about other people, the sin of lush and heart. Our sages tell us that the sin of Lush and Hara is even worse than the three cardinal sins of murder, idol worship, and sexual impropriety, sins for which one must give up their life for. Once Moshe leaves Egypt, he never turned back. He felt that they were not worthy of redemption. This is also the reason why he argued with God at the burning bush for seven days. In his heart of hearts, he felt them unworthy. After all, he was a fugitive because of them. Then there's a measure that said Moshe goes to Cush, which is Ethiopia, and there he becomes a king for 40 years. The Torah reintroduces him when he comes to Midian. Moshe winds up at a spring in Midian. The measure says that he learned about a spring in an appropriate, that a spring is an appropriate place for meeting one's spouse. He learned that from Yitzhak and Yaakov, who also met their spouses at a spring. Womanhood is symbolized by a spring, as the verse in Mishlei chapter 5 states. Drink water from your spring, which is an allusion to a woman. We see that the well in the desert that traveled with the Jewish nation for the 40 years was in the merit of a woman, Miriam. The morale of Prague states that a spring of water is especially related to a woman. The reason given is that a spring flows from the lower to the higher, lower to the higher level, which is contrary to everything else in nature, which has a downward trajectory. This parallels the woman with, who belongs to, for her husband, finding in him elation and cleaving to his higher level. So because of her spring-like nature, a woman is symbolized by a spring of water. While he is at the spring, the daughters of Yisro come to water their sheep, and they are harassed by the other shepherds. The commentaries say that they tried to sexually molest them, Moshe, seeing the injustice, protects the women and waters all the sheep, even those sheep of the other shepherds. He not only brought justice, but also a peaceful solution, resolution to a delicate situation. Little did he know that one of Yisrael's daughters, Sipporah, would become his wife. 
He marries Zipporah and, the shepherd, and shepherds Yisrael's sheep. One day as he was in the desert with the sheep, one little sheep runs away, and Moshe chases it for seven days. When he does find it, it was standing by a pool of water, drinking. He picked up the little ship, sheep on his shoulders and he said, if I would have known that you were thirsty, I would have taken care of it much sooner. God, witnessing Moshe's care and concern about one little sheep, felt that this was the type of leader that he wanted to shepherd his sheep as they traveled, pardon me, as they traveled in the desert. In fact, the name Moshe can be arranged to spell the words Misa, because of the sheep. As he is walking back with the little sheep on his shoulder, he encounters a strange sight. He sees a thorn bush that is burning, but somehow it's not extinguished. He comes closer to investigate, and he, that is where he has his first encounter with God Almighty. When Moshe has this encounter at the burning bush, the verse in Exodus 3, 6 states, Moshe hid his face since he was afraid to look at God. Yet we read further in the book of Exodus, in the portion of Kisisa 33.18, where Moshe asked God, please let me have a vision of your glory. And in verse 19, God answers Moshe in the affirmative and tells him, I will reveal my, the divine name in your presence. Why was it that, that at the burning bush, Moshe turns away from looking at the divinity of God? And yet later he requests to see the divinity of God. If we look closely at the wording of the verses, we see that at the burning bush, the narrative is said with God's name of severity, Elohim. Whereas later, after God had forgiven the nation for the sin of the golden calf, there, God's name of mercy, the yud ke vav -ke, is invoked. God's lesson at the burning bush was that he wanted to teach the Jewish nation that even in times of trouble, if you look, you will always find God's presence. But that was not the lesson Moshe wanted the people to internalize. To be able to see God's benevolent hand even in the worst of scenarios. He felt that they would not often be on such a high level. To be able to accept, to be able to accept that. He didn't want them to be able to blame God for their troubles and suffering. However, when things were going well and life was good, then... He most definitely wanted the people to see it as God's benevolent hand and all their blessings. So Moshe's on the mountain for seven days, and for seven days God argues with Moshe to accept his mission to take the Jews out of Egypt. Moshe refuses. He feels that he is not the man for the job. Humility. But at the same time, he feels that the Jewish nation was unworthy of salvation. He had just spent a good part of his life as a fugitive, because of two of his brethren who turned him into the government. They informed on him to Pyro even after he had saved one of their lives. He felt that these two were the rule. What he didn't know was that what they, what was what that they were the exception. God wanted him to stay away from Egypt and the Jewish people until the time was right. Why would God have to argue with Moshe for seven days? Just to get something, what, just, Guess get someone else. After all, he is God. From here we learn a great lesson stated by Hillel in Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, Mishnah 14. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? Everyone, everyone is created by God with a mission. That mission is unique and chosen only for them. And that is why God argued with Moshe to tell him that taking the Jews out of Egypt was his lifelong mission. Everything that had transpired in his life up until that point was all in preparation for this one event. And this is a lesson for all of us. Each one of us has been chosen by God for a specific purpose in life that only we can fulfill. Let us pray that we can succeed in our chosen mission. You know, there's a saying that people have two great fears in life. One, is death, and the other is public speaking. So at a funeral, there's a question as to whether someone, whether it be lying in the coffin or speaking in front of it. This is said about people in general. One could only imagine how someone with a speech defect would feel about accepting a position that required them to speak publicly. So finally, under duress, Moshe accepts his mission. 
he first goes to get permission from Yisrael. After all, he had told him that he would not leave without his consent. So Moshe takes his wife and two young children and they travel to Egypt. On the way there, they stop off at an inn. There Moshe is attacked by a large snake. The snake swallows him from his head down to his circumcision and then swallows him again, but this time from his feet up to his circumcision. From the snake's actions, Zipporah, his wife, ascertains that Moshe's life was in jeopardy because her son wasn't circumcised yet. So she quickly picks up a sharp stone and circumcises her son, and the snake releases Moshe. So Moshe's youngest son, Eliezer, was just born. It was the eighth day after his birth, and it was time for his circumcision. There are commentaries that say that the required circumcision was not for the newborn son of Eliezer. It was for the, his older son, Gershon. It seems that Yisrael and Moshe had a philosophical debate. Rashi tells us that Yisrael had worshipped every idol in the world. And after examining them all, he then came to the logical conclusion that there's only one God in the world. And so he served that God. So he felt that the only way for a person to truly serve God is to first experience all other religions in the world. And then based on logic, one would have to come to the conclusion that there is only one God, the God of the Jews. Moshe, on the other hand, felt, as the Talmud states, mitok shalolishma balishma, that that which was not done in the name of God will be done in the name of God. So based on that logic, well, we dress the little boys up like little Hasidim. And they go through all the motions, even though they don't necessarily know what or why they are doing the actions that they are being instructed to do. He felt that in the end, they will come to, cor to, to the correct conclusion. So since he was living with Yisrael, Moshe, Moshe was forced to concede to his request. And therefore, he had agreed not to circumcise his firstborn son. However, at the end, the snake was indicating that God wanted Moshe to first circumcise his firstborn son before he continued on his mission. We learn out from that, right is right. Even though Moshe was on a mission to save the whole Jewish nation, still, first he had to tie up the loose ends in his own personal life. After the circumcision, he sends his family back to Midian. They had fulfilled their mission. Now he was ready to start his journey. You know, I think what I'm going to do is stop here and continue next week with the rest of the narrative. Hopefully in that merit, we will be able to receive the Torah again from God Almighty and help to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sakana quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. Again, God should bless you with safety and health and joy. And you should have a great week. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.